much. Okay, thank you everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers. It, you know, given the activity in this workshop, it feels a little bit like uh, somebody's talked about ancient history. So I feel like I've you know, recently turned 40, so I'm now being asked to give historical retrospective talks, in a sense, because this is ancient history. <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder. You just, you, you just gave me a discourse on TikTok over lunch, which I've never seen. So, <laughs> so I think, you know. <laughs> Anyways, anyways, but you know, in my advanced age, I feel like I should give advice to younger people, maybe those who are starting to teach. You know, one of the things you learn when you teach is we're always told that students really care about us setting expectations properly. So I want to work that into this talk. So I want to make sure there's no false advertising. So I guess this isn't working. Let me see. Let me just say that I want to make sure that you know what I'm talking about today. So, you know, no false advertising. I'm setting expectations right at the beginning. Okay, so, you know, in seriousness, I should say that uh, this work I'm going to tell you about is work that done by several people at Oxford, notably, you know, Eve Squan, Ziwei Wang, Glenn Wagner, all students at various stages, some of whom have moved on to others, and Nick Bultink, who is really, you know, and Steve Simon, and Nick was really somebody who really was, led us into this field in many ways. And uh, there's sort of a set of references, and really I'll talk about the first couple here, where most of the, Nick talked uh, quite a lot about these last two papers in this series, so I'll try and make contact with that where possible. And, you know, it's a relatively short talk, so I just want to talk about a single puzzle, which goes back to the very early days, if you like, arguably the very first paper on moriographene, which is this idea that you see correlated insulator states at integer fillings within these seven integer state fillings within the flat bands. And we know that these can't be band insulators for a myriad of reasons, and that they require interactions. And so the question I want to ask is, what is the nature of these correlated insulator states? So there's one question. I'm going to try and give one answer to this today. Again, the, the surprising thing should be that there's one answer and not seven, and that's maybe the place to start. And, okay, there are, uh, the second statement to make, which I won't go into, is that we also know that the standard approach of trying to write down some Hubbard-like description is challenged by the topology and symmetry of these bands. So it's not, you know, it's possible to do it, but it has lots of caveats, you know, various people, many of those in this room have worked on it. And so a different approach may be helpful, and that different approach ties very nicely with the rest of the physics in this conference. And there were these very inspiring experiments first done in David Goldhaber Gordon's group and then for, uh, performed also by uh, Andrea's group here that saw that when you align TBG with HBN, you get very strong, uh, you know, you get quantized anomalous Hall response at certain filling factors. And this is sort of consistent with there being bands with a definite churn number. But of course, because time reversal isn't broken, there needs to be some mechanism to spontaneously break time reversal. And, you know, two different groups uh, really very nicely came up with a theoretical picture of that which is that one can just think of a simple Hund's rule mechanism to flavor polarize these bands. And so you know, just for those of you who don't remember this, you have, you know, when you're talking about filling factor three, you want to put the last electron of, uh, you know, uh, plus three, you want to put the la uh, seventh electron into the system. And if you think of how things are filled, you essentially have a choice of putting it into a churn one or a churn minus one band. And Hund's rule sort of tells you that if you stick all the electrons into one of these flavors, they will maximally avoid each other because of Pauli exclusion and you'll flavor polarize. And so this is actually very reminiscent of an older problem of quantum Hall ferromagnetism of two-dimensional electron gases in high magnetic fields. And you know, while it is different in some interesting ways because of the nature of time reversal breaking and the fact that your, your unoccupied state has the opposite churn number which causes some interesting differences, you know, morally this is very similar to this old idea. And that led to various ways to think about the theory you know, with this very influential picture that at strong coupling, maybe we should take this analogy to quantum Hall ferromagnetism seriously. And there's this very beautiful picture that, you know, again, several people in the room, including some of our organizers and the session chair, uh, came up with is the idea that one should really take this seriously, but actually try and find a point where you can take it even more seriously. And you can tune to a special point where you can have an emergent, very large symmetry, U4 cross U4, which amounts to saying that, you know, you can write down, so you can choose a basis in which bands have a definite churn number. You can rotate freely between bands of the same churn number, which gives you some very large, you can think of this as the world's most painful magnet to deal with because it's some very large, highly symmetric order parameter. And what one can go from there is to recover the physical symmetries by the time method of doing perturbation theories. So you add whatever you think are the physically important things, add deviations from this idealized limit which changes the nature of the form factors, add some single particle dispersion. And what this does for you is predict certain specific states. At nu, it says, well, at nu, what you do is just fill nu plus four of these eight bands. And the idea is that that will break some symmetry. It won't be this huge symmetry. It'll be some smaller subset of physical symmetries. 
But the specific way in which you break them is sort of predicted concretely by this. And so you get an alphabet soup of different phases. And so it's a very beautiful picture. It you know, gives you, you know, it, it putatively answers the question I started out with because it says, you know, it puts a label on each of those seven correlated states. So, you know, quantum anomalous Hall states, a certain type of intervalley coherent state. And it also puts a churn number for each of these. It also, you know, you can do this and you find that each of these integers is a nice robust gap state, which is what's predicted by this strong coupling picture, which is really, again, Hun's rule predicts that you get charge gap states, possibly with some flavor collective modes. It's a really beautiful start, and really, for me, this was, it, having worked on quantum Hall ferromagnetism as part of my PhD, this was really nice, because it, you know, put it in a language that I understood and was familiar with. But in fact, this conflicted with many of the experiments. So the most obvious one was that this was, in some sense, too good to be true. This was working on a system which wasn't aligned with the substrate, and it gave you lots and lots of churn numbers everywhere. So you'd see that every odd integer state has a churn number in this picture, and that's just not what is seen in experiment. Most of the time, you don't get a churn number in TBG unless you work quite hard. The second thing it tells you is that each of these states was a pretty strong, large gap insulator. And that's, again, not consistent with lots of experiments. Of, notably at neutrality, one often sees something that's more semi-metallic. And you don't particularly see strong integers at plus or minus, uh, at plus or minus one. So this was starting to conflict. And another more subtle thing, which you know, naively, if you do the calculation, you often think that you get the right Landau fans because the sequence in which you break symmetries. But if you actually work a little bit harder and think about realistic effects from the dispersion, where you kind of think about how the dispersions change, you often don't get quite the correct Landau fans from this picture. So it seems that while we have this very beautiful theoretical picture, it, this strong coupling approach is inconsistent with the observed phenomenology. And this was the state of affairs when Nick came to Oxford. And we started thinking about whether there's other ways you can think about this. And one of the things that was important was that the fact that, you know, while you're at strong coupling, maybe the coupling isn't that strong. Maybe it's worth moving away towards an intermediate coupling problem, but still starting with this lens of strong coupling and asking, how do we go away from this manifold of strong coupling states? You've got to think a little bit more about the kind of states you're looking for, uh, not quite working within that strong coupling manifold. And there are various reasons you might think that TBG is really at intermediate coupling. The first, one reason is that, you know, if you think about the Hartree effects, there's some kind of, the Berry curvature is not uniform through the Bill 1 zone. So even if I start with a flat band, there's some complicated form factor of the electronic wave functions, and that can lead to a non-trivial dispersion, even just doing some simple Hartree calculation will give you some non-trivial dispersion, which you, have to, you should be confronted with because that's the same scale as the interaction that you're working with. So these are comparable scales. And the second thing you might worry about is that realistic samples have strain, and that strain is known to increase the dispersion of the band. So these are two reasons why you might say that working directly in the strong coupling limit is not so useful. So we decided to take this seriously and look for what might happen in this regime. And what you find is that for all non-zero integers, you get a single notion of order. As call it a single phase, that's a little bit of uh, art creative license. What is the statement is that there's a certain type of broken symmetry that's observed in each of these cases sometimes coexisting with a gap, sometimes with a narrow or vanishing gap within the resolution of numerics that you can do. But crucially, what you find is that it's a universally a churn zero state at all the integers, and it's gap sizes, the trending of gaps where you get a semi-metal at neutrality, weak gaps at plus or minus one, stronger gaps at plus or minus two, and so on, um, are consistent with the experiment if we invoke this new type of order, this incommensurate Kekulé spiral. And I should point out that actually, uh, by really beautiful work by Dan Parker, had already pointed out that strain played an important phenomenon role in reproducing this experimental observation that the neutrality point is a semi-metal. So the ingredient really, I should be specific, is heterostrain, which is the relative strain between the two layers. And this is something that we don't have to take on faith that it should be there. We can look in STM and see that uh, it's actually present in STM, looking at STM data. And it stabilizes the pneumatic semi-metal at nu equals zero, and these IKF at nu not equal to zero. Uh, second piece of phenomenology, which you can ask, again, you know, I would take this, if you can, if you take numerics with a grain of salt, you should take this with a large spoonful of salt, because we're going to do hard tree fork in a metallic state. But you could ask, what does it look like when I dope these correlated insulators? And that's something that we did do. And what you see is that there's a nice, this is sort of a picture of, a, if you like, a putative global phase diagram. Um, there's, a, there's a very busy plot, so let me just flag what it's showing. Essentially, you can think of this axis as strain, but what you want to think about is something that increases the bandwidth and moves you away from a weak coupling to strong coupling. This axis uh, should, unfortunately, should be reversed. So basically, 
the things that say quantum hold ferromagnetic-like character are the red things down here. These look like the strong coupling states. And the things that say IKS-like character are the things up here, where they, you know, it's just characterizing some order parameter. There's some proxy for which, whether you're in one of these, closer to one of these strong coupling states or one of these weak coupling states, and that's what it's looking at. And what you see is that above some modest level of strain, you sort of start seeing that the states, the integers we already knew from working at the integers, but you see that the order seems to persist in a finite window. Now, of course, this is Hartree-Fock, it's mean field. What it says about really a metallic state preserving order should be something that, you know, again, as I said, take it with a large spoonful of salt, but at least it gives you a picture of what's going on as you dope away. So it sort of says that, you know, for reasonable strains, and I put the arrow here, which is sort of saying the point at which you stop seeing any of the strong coupling states, you sort of enter this regime where you're really dominated by these, this IKS type order. A second comment, which is maybe also pertinent to the next talk after the break, is that, you know, Notice that what I've plotted here is the chemical potential as a function of new, and you see sort of roughly sawtooth-like features. And notice it doesn't seem to really care in any sharp way that I went from a completely different phase diagram of strong coupling states down here to these intermediate coupling states up here. The sort of fact that you see cascades in the compressibility are just really a statement that you form some kind of incompressible state of the integers. And it's not a particularly discriminating feature that tells you anything about the broken symmetry states. And that seems to be consistent with the idea that these cascade features persist up to very high temperatures uh, relative to the formation of correlated insulating states which happen at much lower temperature. Uh, second thing I should say, but I think, you know, this is something that was a calculation we did, but I think uh, Oscar's very nice talk yesterday makes some of this redundant. Uh, what you can do is actually just compute a, a poor man's Landau fan. What a poor man's Landau fan is doing is just saying, state B equals zero, dope the system, look at the, firm, the number of equal area Fermi surfaces that you get, count them, and claim that you'll get the right Landau fan structure by how they evolve. Now, the honest calculation is to really do Hartree Fock in a field. What's very nice if you looked at Oscar's talk yesterday is that at low fields, this is actually indeed consistent with his calculations. He flashed it for a bit yesterday, but this was in there that when you have strain in the sample and work at IKS, you get the correct Landau facts. Okay, so this is all phenomenology of the sort which doesn't allow direct spectroscopic probes. If you like, it's transport, quantum oscillation data, thermodynamic measurements. In order to go further, I should say what the state is. And, but before that, I should say one last thing, which somebody was asking me if there's a way you can think about the robustness of the state. Why is it so prevalent in the phase diagram? And we can speculate on that. You know, it is because numerically, but we can speculate on a physical reason why that might be true. And one of the things we did very early on was just say, the state is a state which is characterized by a single wave vector Q. That you can think of as a variational parameter. And you could ask, how does the energy depend on that variational parameter if I happen to get it slightly wrong? So if I pick the wrong wave vector, they're not the optimum one. And what you see is this kind of pattern, which is just doing numerics on different system sizes as a function of this variational parameter, which is, I'll explain what it means physically, but just think of it as a parameter in the system. And this sort of labels a manifold of states which have morally the same kind of order that differ in some details. And what you notice here is the energy scale of this is about, you know, a tenth of an, about, you know, a tenth of an MeV on average, which is roughly, about a half as small as the energy of the next competing strong coupling state for much of the phase diagram. So what this roughly tells you is the nature of the state is such that because it has this variational freedom, to be discussed in a moment what it really means physically, if you change parameters in the problem, you can adjust this variational parameter and stay in the same state, whereas a strong coupling state being somehow a rigid Q equals zero state doesn't have, in some sense, as much variational freedom. A ferromagnet is the same no matter way, the way you look at it. Here, the state can adjust in response to, say, a small change in twist angle, whether local or global, things like that. So it gives you some sense in which why this might be a very competitive state because of the sort of extra, and that there's a manifold of these states that all have very similar properties. So to go further, I should say a little bit about what this state is. So let me remind ourselves that this is a state where there's intervalley coherence. And intervalley coherence is what happens when you hybridize the microscopic valleys in graphene. So if you remember, if I think of the Brill ones and draw a valley block sphere, up and down correspond to polarizing your states at the k and k prime points of the graphene Brill ones. So there's nothing to do with the Moray scale. This is all happening on the graphene scale. And remember that when we think about Moray graphene, we've always elevated this to an internal symmetry. We're sort of coarse graining that away and putting it as an internal symmetry when we think about these models. So it's hidden inside. And intervalley coherence corresponds to interference between the k and k prime wave functions, roughly. 
and we can think of the phase of that inter and interference between these roughly speaking creates a standing wave around my honeycomb and choosing the phase chooses where the peaks and troughs of that standing wave line up so for instance if i have a particular choice of phase if i look in real space i get some kind of a particular type of root 3 by root 3 symmetry breaking but you can see that i could have still gotten the same root 3 by root 3 order but oriented slightly differently by changing this phase and it would mean that some of this red would become smaller, the blue would become larger and I would sort of push some of the charge off from here to here. So there are different patterns and one way to think about this is that this is intervalley coherence but if I actually think about what's happening when I have realistic interactions and I have strain, first of all strain breaks C3 symmetry and I'll get to a, I'll maybe say a little bit about why we think that C3 breaking is actually important for this state. But given that it's broken C3, it de uh, decouples the Dirac points from the zone corners and reshapes the dispersion. And in particular, if you stare at this dispersion, you see that there are two patches in the dispersion, which I've just highlighted. It's not rigorous, but it's just flagging that there's a region which has a low energy pocket and a high energy pocket. So this is a color map of the dispersion. And of course, it's time reversed in the other valley. So the dispersion in one valley develops these features peaks and troughs, which are mirrored in the other valley. And if you think about an optimal Hartree-Fox state, you can convince yourself that a good variational state, so one thing you could do is a strong coupling state might just valley pole, you can imagine valley polarizing everywhere. And that'll pay some penalty because you've got to spend some time in the high energy or the low energy pocket. You could imagine doing IVC everywhere, but then again, you spend some time in the low energy pocket uh, or some time in the high energy pocket. But something you might be willing to do is say, you know, if I could only align myself in the low and fully valley polarize in the low energy pocket whenever I don't want to be in the other valley. And the way to do this is to actually boost these um, Brillouin zones in the two valleys by Q. You have a, if the valleys have hybridization at a finite wave vector, then it's possible to valley polarize always in the low energy lobe and line it up so that you're maximally avoiding the high energy lobe in the other valley. So you line up the high energy lobe in valley K with the low energy lobe in valley K prime. Thanks to time reversal, this flips it in the other valleys. And in those patches, you always valley polarize into the low energy pocket. Everywhere else, you just have IVC. And as Nick pointed out, there are sort of topological constraints on exactly how this IVC winds, and that sort of tells you everything you need to know about this state. And so this is a picture of what you do. You line these things up, and you get this IVC state, and you get this. But the important thing is that this is happening at a finite Q, and this Q is, again, on the Moray scale. So what does this mean for my order in real space? In real space, this is where you get this idea of a Kekulé spiral, so let's unpack that. Kekulé already said what it meant because this was the fact that when you had intervalley coherence, you had this Kekulé charging pattern on the, I, I should emphasize that it's a Kekulé in the charge channel. You could have also had a Kekulé in the current channel that's related to the KIVC state. This is a charge Kekulé pattern. And it's on the microscopic single layer graphene scale. And if I look on this, what I've sketched here is how this pattern evolves as I go from one Moray unit cell to the other. The spiral piece has the fact that there's the single wave vector that modulates the Kekulé pattern on the Moray scale, and you go from having it, you know, or, so what I've sketched is an you know, artist's impression of this um, um, IVC vector rotating in space, and what that means is if I look in one AA region, I would see a pattern like this, and this pattern slightly ro rotated as I go from AA, one AA region to the next. And so over space, this is modulated. And importantly, because this Q was done by something on the Moray scale, and we've given up microscopic knowledge of what's happening in the graphene scale, at this level of calculation, nothing actually t pins that Q to the microscopic lattice. So it can be incommensurate on the Moray scale, because it doesn't, you know, the graphene and Moray scale don't talk to each other. So locking in a pattern on the graphene scale does not actually, at this level of approximation, translate into locking a pattern on the Moray scale, right? So in some sense, this is taking advantage of the Moray physics, because it sort of says there's a separation of scales, so I can choose to do something differently on the Moray scale than I would be dictated to do on the microscopic scale if I took this very seriously, in that sense, if I took the microscopic charging um, as a rigorous thing for what I have to do in space. This motivates an idea that because there's a sharp real space order parameter, and crucially in the density channel, which you can image in STM, um, you might ask, can we look at this? And in fact, there's very nice work by uh, authors, including some people here, I believe. I think Tomo was involved in some of this work. It's a very nice analysis of what kind of IVC patterns would be available, would be accessible to STM. And in fact, I thought that was a very surprising thing in that paper because, you know, there is this historic strong coupling state, the KIVC state, which you would naively think, you know, it's a current order, which is hard to see, but the naive expectation would be that if you, sorry? 
Oh, it'll, it'll be fine. I think it's 10, 10, 10 percent, so it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can't. I, this has never happened before. Somebody asked me to speak faster at a conference. <laughs> Please record this for posterity, right? Because then I can use this. Anyway, so let me go back. I'll try and uh, ignore that. Let's see. Oops. Sorry about this. Yeah. Okay. So to me, what was very surprising about this is this very nice analysis that said, you know, if you have a KIVC pattern, that's some kind of current order parameter. Current naively is not something you can image in STM. We, I was always taught to believe that if I take a current, the square of a current is a scalar. And so you would say that if you had some current order, you would probably see the square of that should be a density. You should be able to image that. What's very special about the KIVC state is there's an extra symmetry in the problem that essentially kills this, you know, the fact that you have a current pattern at second order, you'd expect a charge. You just don't see it. So if you like, this is STM dark matter. You can't see the KIVC state in STM. But the other patterns, either the IKS or a cousin of the TIVC, which is like a, a, a Q equals zero state in the charge channel, those are visible in STM in local density of states modulations. So yeah, the uh, Ali Yazdani's group decided to actually do this experiment. And you know, I, I think that you know, this is a very tricky experiment. There's a lot of analysis that went in. I think Tomo really pioneered a lot of this analysis. So he's the person to ask for all the details on this. It's really kind of a heroic piece of uh, analyzing experimental data. So what they did was they started out with taking a sample which they knew had some strain. And what I'm showing you here is that, that Ali was supposed to speak uh, at this conference. So, you know, we've been a double act at a few conferences. So I feel like Laurel without Hardy or Hardy without Laurel at the moment. So um, anyway, so what he notices is that in STM, he looks near the correlated insulator at nu equals minus two. And so what he's plotting is if he looks away from this far away, what he's doing is Fourier transforming in an AA region. And at large doping, you just see prominent Bragg peaks when you're far away from minus two, which are just the Bragg peaks of graphene that you expect to see. But as you come closer to nu equals minus two, you see the Bragg peaks that correspond to this root three by root three charge order on the graphene scale. So this on its own tells us that we have Kekulé charge order, but that on its own isn't enough to distinguish, for instance, between the IKS and the TIVC. What you need to do to diagnose the Kekulé spiral is the next piece. You need to show that the order spirals on the Moray scale. To do that, what you need to do is observe the phase winding. And this is where the really hairy bit of the analysis comes in, because you need to extract the phase and the amplitude of the Kekulé peaks by doing Fourier transforms of smaller regions. And so the way uh, Tomo and Mike Zalop and others did this was to construct three different IVC order parameters and track their evolution in the Moray scale. So I won't go, I'll just go through this briefly. Basically, you can show that there's very good uh, conclusions between experiment and theory. These are sort of abstract plots. I really like one I stole from Kevin Knuckles' talk, which basically looks at different AA regions and reads out what this IVC phase does. And it indeed winds in an incommensurate way, roughly three Moray unit cells, but not precisely, which is actually in very good agreement with the theoretical prediction. So this is confirming that there's a notion of IKS order. And in sort of quite dramatically, I think, uh, this was, I wasn't there, but Ali talked about this work at Aspen about a year and change ago. And more or less in the next talk, Stevan's group pointed out that they saw something very similar in symmetrically twisted uh, uh, trilayer graphene. So it's sort of a nice confirmation that it, this, this work, uh, this is also there in another Moray system. Let me just summarize some recent theory progress. So again, you know, at some point we were exhorted by, uh, maybe it was Sendil, that we need to go beyond Hartree Fox. So I don't do that, but I have friends who, you know, some of my best friends do things that are beyond Hartree Fox. So Mike Zalatel and Nick Bolting uh, and others in the room actually worked quite hard and found IKS at nu equals uh, minus three in using DMRG at very small strain. Uh, for those of you who are tempted to try this yourself, I just encourage you to look at the bond dimension they needed and then reconsider. <laughs> Um, the second thing I should say is that one of the mysteries of Ali's experiment was that when we went to, when they went to very low strain samples, you know, they should have seen dark matter, KIVC, where you don't see any signal. But instead, they saw actually a robust signal, but apparently that moved to Q equals zero. And that was a little bit of a mystery, but you know, in a conversation with Erez Berg and uh, we, and uh, Yves Kwan and others, we figured out that if you think about certain types of phonons that couple to lattice distortions in a nice way, you could come up with a plausible argument that actually, the K, even at strong coupling, there could be a competition between the Kekulé charge and the Kekulé density orders. Basically, because the Kekulé, sorry, Kekulé charge and Kekulé current orders, because the Kekulé current order is symmetry forbidden from developing any charging, it can't take any elastic advantage of the phonon distortion, whereas the Kekulé density can, and that kind of can tip the energy balance. 
Um, I should say that uh, we, we did some work which we never published, which sort of tries to ask whether you can see this as some weak coupling instability of a renormalized semi-metal. The sort of results are semi-plausible, but not, you know, hard, they're hard to fully interpret. I should say that in recent things I've heard that, you know, Andre Bernavig has sort of seen these IKF states in his sort of heavy fermion picture. And I think Patrick and Eslam, possibly I think Patrick's talk next week, will talk a little bit about other ways to think about uh, broken symmetry states and quasi-local moments uh, in, these, uh, in these states. So I think I look forward to that next week. Um, I should flash up one other statement, which is that, you know, we all uh, spurred on by the fact that um, this was seen in twisted trilayers by the Caltech XT STM experiments, you know, once you've seen an experiment, it's quite easy to, you know, it's, there's a famous statement that it's hard to make predictions about, especially about the future, but it's usually easy to make predictions about the past, so there's a prediction about the, what happened in the past. So once this was seen, we could show that if you have strain, you can stabilize this IKS state robustly at new equals two, also in symmetric trilayers. And an important thing there is that one thing they tracked was the evolution of the IKS vector uh, with doping, and that's roughly consistent with the experiment. We can sort of see that. Um, Something very recent, and I'm happy to talk about this offline. Uh, this is work with Mitali Banerjee's group at EPFL. So what she was doing was doing thermodynamic measurements and transport measurements on twisted trilayers. But um, what she's doing is able to sweep displacement field and, uh, and density. And what she sees is, roughly speaking, two superconducting domes, which you can quantify at two domes in terms of the robustness to temperature or applied magnetic field, between minus two and minus three. And the features of those domes and the positions of those are roughly coincident with the fact that in the old Caltech X STM experiments for unconventional superconductivity, there was a change from a V-shape to a U-shaped gap in spectroscopy. And we sort of, con roughly speaking, the two domes coincide the V to U evolution. So, uh, and there's some IV hysteresis data that suggests that one of those domes could be consistent with a nodal superconductor and the other with a nodeless one. Um, and just to say that if we think about this IKS state seriously and look at it, uh, this is just a sketch of doing mean field, but asking about the Fermi surfaces that you get on doping into the IKS state around these fillings. And the only thing to take away from this is they seem to be qualitative changes in the where the doped carriers go in it, that track qualitative features in this uh, phase diagram that's in Mitali's experiment. So it's just an interesting empirical finding. I'm not sure yet what to make of it. You know, you can build a story on this, but it's not something that I would be, you know, 100% safe in doing. So, that, but there's just a, a bit of food for thought. Let me just say one last thing because Nick promised that I would say it. So Nick talked about this idea that there's something topological about this IKS state that goes beyond just this broken symmetry of it. And so what he mostly focused on was this idea of this churn texture. If you think of a uh, of an intervalley coherence between churn plus or minus one bands. Of course, in twisted bilayer graphene, it's not really a churn band. You need sort of two sets of churn bands. And that the basis in which the churn number is obvious is not really the right basis to work in for the single particle Hamiltonian. But ultimately, there's a topological invariant linked to the C2Z symmetry. And what you can show is that if you had intervalley coherence between these uh, states in the appropriate channel, then you can get, you essentially can show their topological features in this IKS wave function. But what's interesting here is that there's some new energetic competition. Because you have this four band problem, if the, uh, you can actually unwind the topology in a different way. So you don't have to have this topologically enforced texture, texture. You can do something a little bit funny by breaking C2Z in a way that forces the churn number to be zero. That sort of unlocks this topological obstruction. And it tends to be that this generically happens um, this generically happens whenever you have the Dirac cones at the zone, uh, at the, where they started out at the zone corner, the Moray Dirac cones at the zone corners. But once you put on heterostrain, you unpin the, bio, the graphene Dirac points from the zone corners and move them to the interior. And it turns out just energetically, this, the trivial possibilities are penalized and you stabilize the IKS type insulator. So I think I'm just about out of time, so let me just give you a summary. I hope what I've tried to convince you is that this Kekulé, incommensurate Kekulé spiral is a sort of generic correlated state in realistic, and by realistic, the only real as re major aspect of realism we need is uh, non-zero strains. That's the minimal realism of twisted bilayer and trilayer graphene. And it has gap trends, churn numbers, Landau fans, and so on, consistent with experiments. Its robustness, we think, is linked to the fact that, you know, the system, the you can stay in the same phase, but adjust this 
you know, modulation vector while staying in the same phase, maybe even spatially. That's an interesting question of what that means if you can have spatial, you've started to think about that, whether you pin to twist angle disorder in some interesting way. And there's a notion in which this is a, a, a certain type of topological state, summarized much better by Nick earlier in the week. Um, the order parameter is a graphene scale Kekulé charge modulation that's actually also modulated on the Moray scale, and that's directly detected in a pair of beautiful STM experiments. I mean, there are open, many open questions, and I'm happy to take more from you. But maybe to me, things are interesting are, you know, how does order disappear on doping? There's something that, you know, uh, Sendel actually flagged my attention to when I talked about this, the Gordon conference with him, that it seems to, cra uh, looking at it, at least if you look, it doesn't seem to really persist that far in the experiment away from um, the integers to the extent that we know. So the question is, when you're doping significantly away from the integers, do you have this order or has it gone before you start forming superconductivity? I think it's an important question to ask. And that's also linked to the question of whether there's some kind of parent state or competitor for superconductivity. And as I think even a previous speaker today flagged, you know, this kind of incommensurate IVC order has just recently been reported, at least theoretically, in ABC graphene, where in fact there's been some argument that the collective modes of that could be linked to the superconductivity in this very recent theory paper. And so let me leave you with that and take your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sid. First question. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Really interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about the order disappearing on doping. Yeah. Um, so you said something about how QIKS um, varies between yeah. minus two and minus three. Yeah. I was wondering if you could expand on that, specifically because one of the pictures I have of yeah. re reason why IKS is so energetically favorable is this notion of like gamma point avoidance or filling up the gamma point. Right. Because, you know, if you form an ordinary strong coupling insulator, you can only occupy some of the gamma point electrons, right. but the hard tree dispersion wants you to occupy all of them. Yeah. But that, it's kind of hard to think about that after you dope, because if you're comparing IKS and strong coupling, you'll fill the gamma point both, yeah. both of them. And so I was wondering if QIKS changes a lot when you dope as a result it, of that. It does seem to change considerably. Like, you know, I, I should show it. We have it in some plots. I'm happy to show you offline. I'm, I considered putting it in, and then I decided not to. So maybe, and I don't have a backup slide on it. But we actually tracked it. So one uh, unfortunate thing is QIKS is not something you can easily, there's this sort of lobe principle. But where the lobes lie is a self-consistently determined thing. So what you do empirically, at least in the integers, it's very easy. What you do is just look at the symmet you don't allow symmetry to break. So you do symmetric Hartree-Fock, you look at the two valley dispersions, and then you get a pretty good sense of where the lobes are. And that principle sort of works away from, uh, you can sort of guess this as you go away. In fact, that's in some sense how you eyeball it so you don't spend time searching in some un, you know, unprofitable Q value. You kind of get a first guess of Q by just staring at this. Uh, Often that's a useful first step. So that's at least a heuristic way of doing it. But once you start putting in all the features, it doesn't track anything obviously. And in fact, it doesn't even have to change continuously as you change parameters. It can jump around quite a bit. Now, I don't sort of think that experimentally it would do that so easily. You would think that things would be smoother. Some of this is an artifact of Hartree Fock. But I think given the, si the kind of mesh sizes and things that you can do and you're trying to pick a queue, very small things can make it jump all the way across. So one has to be a bit more careful. But there is certainly substantial evolution. I think the Caltech experiment, it kind of goes kind of all over the place. It kind of walks across and comes, you know, crosses the bronze one boundary and comes in on the other side sort of thing. So it's a significant evolution of this Q vector. So I think it is a good point to make that it, and that may be a good way to rationalize why it evolves in order to optimize the filling in this way. Thanks. Uh, just a comment, uh, in two talks from now I'll show some, some evidence of uh, <coughs> nodal points of the flat bands moving away from K points. Oh, that's fine. Great. And that's uh, pneumatic semi-metal. Great. It's at charge neutrality. Great. Hey, uh, nice talk. I was just wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about this disappearance of um, the order on doping, because in twisted trialer graphene, that's not at all what happens. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that if I, I'm just reporting what's in the, so maybe actually Tomo knows more about this than I do, because he was involved in the, I don't know how much he wants to say about it, but I was just reporting on this, at least if I look at Ali's, oh, I'm sorry, I've gone a bit too far. If I look at Ali's experiment, 
right? This is what I'm really saying. If you look here, what they're showing you is as you dope away, it doesn't go away immediately, of course, but you know, well before you get to minus three, you know, uh, this is supposed to tell you the normalized IVC strength, and it does look like it crashes pretty quickly. That's not what we see numerically, it actually is pretty persistent, right? You can see in those plots a sufficiently high strain, it persists. I don't know what to make of this data. I mean, maybe uh, I, I, Sendel may have some. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it does yeah. peak. What? It, I think it peaks actually around like 2.5 for Tyler. Yeah, yeah that, that might be yeah. the case, yeah. But. This is, I think that's the problem also that this is the low strain sample. This particular thing is the low strain sample, so it's a bit, so maybe Tomo knows, but he was on the experiment paper, so, you know. Uh, as, uh, to quote somebody else, this is not my work. <laughs> I guess I don't have that excuse. Well, uh, that I, I, I don't want to say anything too definitive because there's nuance. Uh, yeah. One thing is that this is low strain data. That's right, yeah, uh, I should have mentioned that. If you yeah. look at the high strain data, which is where the vast majority of the rest of the paper is on, for example, the ICAS state, then the behavior is different. Where it's clearest is actually by going to the high strain sample at the positive fitting, so not where yeah. superconductivity is seen, okay. but you still see the ICAS state, then there you see it goes strong all IVC all the persisting way all the way between plus two and plus three. So um, you don't have plots, you don't have plots of this for the, that, right? Yeah, yeah that's I'm what I was hoping, I, I looked a lot for them, but I couldn't find them, so I should have flagged that this is the zero strain sample. Yes, Sendo yeah. is itching to say something. Yeah, I don't know if this is an appropriate thing to do, since uh, during your talk I would ask for more question. About I, this, this, this is great, is you know? good? <laughs> I mean, yeah, as, okay. as, you know, I, I'm no longer Indian, I'm British, so outsourcing is fine for me to do now. <laughs> right, really. <laughs> so since this is up on the screen, and since you just said that, and as this paper, your paper shows, yeah. between plus two and plus three, indeed, uh, IKS, or some version of IKS, with some reasonable amplitude persists, uh, what is actually the statement between minus two and minus three? Well, that's not shown, at least it's not highlighted in the paper. Uh, my understanding is that it, it, we just, I really don't want to say we, uh, the experiment didn't have as fine as a uh, scan of what, what was happening as a function of gate voltage. At least I personally don't remember seeing that careful analysis of what the uh, IVC order parameter looks like in that region. Yeah, it's like 2.7 is, yeah. it, minus 2.7 is it there? I don't know. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just don't remember. Yeah, seeing, okay, seeing it's that a good, to, maybe it's worth knowing that I think is important. Yeah, I, I should say actually, yeah, in Stefan's data at least, there it seems like there's a way to extract the IKS vector and as, as you mentioned, it does peak and you know this well, it peaks between two and three, even the order parameter is even stronger, apparently. And, or, yeah, yeah. you know the numbers, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because in a metallic state, what is it really doing, yeah. Good. Okay. So can I first find who's gonna answer my next question and then they can be asked? <laughs> it's very efficient. Any other questions? Well, it doesn't no. seem like it, so yeah. That's Patrick quick. seemed to oh. have a question Do again. Have one so. final? Yeah, uh, just one more on the... I guess I'm wondering how seriously to take this low picture for how to find Q, given yeah. that you kind of said that Q is a very, very soft variable to yeah. begin with. And I kind of know that one major feature in the dispersion is this hard tree dip, yeah. but I don't really know how to interpret the other lobe. Um, yeah, so I think the way you can think about it is that you stare at the dispersion, the heart rate dip is one of them, of course, and the other one is just, you know, whatever, once you break C2 with strain and things, there's other features, so you try and do the optimum, you pick whatever maximum that you have, there's the heart rate dip, and the point is that you just move it, you, you, because they're just two points, you can always find a boost that try and pops them on top of each other optimally. That's basically the idea. And time reversal sort of guarantees the rest. What I will say is once you, I can't predict where that lobe comes in, but if I numerically give you this, uh, this heart rate, just give you the heart rate and strain renormalized dispersion and don't do any symmetry breaking, don't do any searching over, you know, 
I paint it as a single queue order, but we actually found it in an Edisonian way of actually looking for real translational breaking, because single queue order is not, re you know, you can get away with it by playing this trick, but actually we swept in real translational breaking, so there's a lot of work to find it in the first time. But then in hindsight, once you see the dispersion, you don't have to do very much, you just stare at it, you look at the minima and you guess a queue, and it actually, once you've guessed a single queue, you can essentially write down what you think the Hartree Fox state should be, and that essentially gets most of the way to the answer right away. You can just write down the projector, and there's a trial state you can just write down as soon as you, so this piece you have to do numerically to get the dispersion, but then you can write down the projector and put it into the computer, and it is a very good variational state. It's almost exact, 95% of the way to the answer. And in fact, I think when the Caltech uh, experiments were done, I think in the theory, you had a very good match to the data without having to do full Hartree Fock, right? You just did the Hartree and then matched the wave vector, and that, that, that it was even good enough to match experiment, I think, reasonably. Yeah, but okay. It certainly matches our numerics, so whether it matches experiment, you know, that's high quality of life. So, can I understand? <laughs> So okay. can I understand the softness of this Q then as like the, this lobe being kind of broad and floppy? Yeah, you can, the fact is that there's some floppiness in how you choose the lobe and you know, some yeah. small detail, exactly that. Yeah. Very good. Maybe it's harder to tell what Q you're going to get as soon as you move away from doing yeah, the Yeah, as soon as you move away from the integers, it's harder, yeah. And I think that's what we were yeah. doing. Yeah. It, it works very well at minus at the integers. It works less well away. It works sort of as a guide, but you would still search a little bit more because, as you said, there's other things that go into the question there. Yeah. Islam, I guess. Yeah. So, um, in the strong coupling, there's usually there's very strong asymmetry between the electron dispersion and hole dispersion, precisely because of Hartree. Yeah. And the IKS is supposed to try to get rid of this Hartree yeah. aspect. So. But still, the experiment is asymmetric. So, so is the is there strong dispersion between particle and hole in the IKS? There seems to be. Yeah, there still seems to so be. So why? Good question, actually. I, maybe Nick. I, I mean, I think it's. Yeah. But since we're all asking questions to each other, yeah. like I know Oscar showed IKS fans. Yeah. So maybe actually, maybe as maybe the chair, we, we just... should uh, dissolve the session into discussion. Yeah. So I don't have a sharp answer for you for that one. It's a good question, and I think framed like yeah. that. I hadn't framed it to myself like that, and it's a very good one. And I think it's worth thinking about. Very yeah. good on but, that note. Yeah, I think it's all connected to the heavy light the dichotomy and the fans going one way, and yeah. like how this happened. I guess I think yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah, discuss this offline. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's about time. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Thank you.